have Rana Gulistan for Baswell, Imran Ahmed for Roli, Imran Ahmed for Roli, Tahir Mahmood for Blackburn Central, Muntazir Patel for Shebrow and Corporation, Riff Howard for Blackburn South East, Bakar Hussain for Billingham Beardwood, Mr. Iqbal Masters for Wensley Fold, Siraj Mohammed for Ewood, and Mr. Amin Kapadia for Audley and Queen's Park. Welcome, ladies and gents. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming, giving the opportunity time for us and supporting us. We're deeply honored to host this event surrounded by individuals, organizations who share our vision and support our cause. On behalf of the Blackburn Redaran Independence Group, we extend a warm welcome and heartfelt gratitude for your unwavering support. We would like to express our appreciation to the Workers' Party and George Galloway. A round of applause for George, please. <laughs> for their steadfast backing and independent groups up and down the UK. The upcoming uh, election, 2nd of May 2024, marks a pivotal movement in the UK politics. Never before have we witnessed such a significant wave of Labour councillors resigning and embracing independence. This presents a unique opportunity for voters to voice their opinions in mainstream politics uh, by supporting the independent groups. The Labour Party, which once we supported, no longer aligns with our views, values or aspirations. As evidenced by a statement from Starmer and our local Labour leader expressing indifferences to vote, voters' support endorsing oppression, action against Palestinians, it is clear that a change is needed. Local Labour uh, leader has said the following. This is these words I'm quoting. I don't care if none of you vote for me. Well, that's what he said, the local Bill Riley. I'm sure you've come across that one. And Starmer, as you always know, on the LBC, said that Israel has the right to cut off water, food, electric to two million Palestinians. Is this humane? Ask yourself that question when voting on 2nd of May. The historical context of King David hotel bombing, 1946, 22nd July, 91 killed, was the start of the Zionist terrorist state of Israel. Hamas was created and supported by Israel in 1987 to counter PLO. If I do make a mistake, I'm sure George will correct me on the history of this, but maybe this is what my understanding is. And this was to underscore uh, the complexities of the situation in the Middle East. Supporting Palestine does not equate to anti-Semitism or anti-anything. We, we're supporting humans, regardless of their color, creed, religion, whatever. A child is a child, a human is a human, whatever. They, we all bleed same. The suppression of dissident within the Labour Party demonstrates the di directive to boycott pro-Palestinian events, raises concerns about freedoms of expression and accountability. Labour whip sent out emails to councillors, do not attend any pro-Palestinian gatherings of any type. I challenge any of the Labour councillors in Blackburn, because we're in Blackburn, or anywhere in the UK, uh, to prove me wrong on that subject. Israel's disregard for international law and human rights is taxed. Support from US highlights the need for principled leadership and global solidarity. How many UN resolutions has Israel ignored and no action has been taken? The UN Security Council, when it comes to some of the other countries who maybe ignored one resolution, uh, they were invaded and plundered, murdered their citizens. This is history. I'm not here to give a longer history lesson here, but I'm sure just a bullet pointing would be good. We challenge Labour councillors to defend their position on Israel's actions and the treatment of members who advocate for justice in Palestine. If the crunch here with the Labour, invite them here now or any time before the 2nd of May 
election just to come out and say we stand with Palestine or maybe say free Palestine. No sooner would they have said this, they would have either been kicked out or suspended. They are not allowed to even say that, but we can, we're independents. In Blackburn, our commitment now coming down to the local ones, in Blackburn, our independence council is extended beyond the international issues. Is somebody messing about with my microphone? <laughs> okay, uh, addressing such as housing, schools, roads, policing, cleansing, and social issues, uh, community centers, taxi drivers, local businesses, and how we can support them. Parking, local faith-based interaction, which is very important, I think, to bring the communities together to understand each other. Uh, we pledge to serve our community and, and our, our voters in, in Blackburn. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, we in Blackburn, I'm going to make this very, very clear for the Labour. We in Blackburn, we invite live, open dialogue and debate on any platform, television, radio, social media, before 2nd of May elections to discuss, debate Labour's achievements on Palestine from any Labour MP or councillors of Blackburn with Darwin Borough Council. Do you know where we are? Thank you very much, Mr. Gullistan. I think they want me to finish there. That would be the last. We invite them to come in, have a, a live debate with us. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for the Blackburn Independent. Any questions for the candidates? Anybody would like to ask any questions? No hands going up. That's good. They must be doing the vote. Hold on a second. Uh, it's Yasin here from Friends of Aluxa. Um, in my speech earlier, I touched on um, how you need to focus on the youth and how their vote is also important for yourselves. So I want to know what you're going to do in engaging with the youth um, to try and convince them to vote for yourselves. I can tell you, half of my team is 17, 18 and 19, and two of them are here. Judge, can you endorse our candidates, please? I pray for the victory of each and every one of you. Each and every one of you. Absolutely. Thank you very much, and thank you very much, Blackburn Independence. If there's no any questions, anybody have got any questions for the independence? One second. First of all, I would like to say that your bravery shows that you can stand up and you can still serve your community. It is immensely proud to put at this moment, I've come from Leicester, and I'm proud to see that so many councillors from Leicester, from, sorry, Blackburn, have stood up and proved that we can stand together and we can still serve the community, and I congratulate you from the bottom of my heart. And I wish you every success in the next election as well. Very good. So, just to confirm on that, these are our candidates. Can I ask the councillors to come forward as well, please? Councillor Sonnet, Councillor Selma Patel, Councillor Mustafa Desai, Councillor Abdul Patel. We, the independent councillors, who stood down from Labour after we heard the speech from Angela that we don't matter. Yay! Have we got any other councillors in the room who have stepped down from any other town? Please stand up. Let's give them a round of applause, please. Okay, thank you, chaps. You can go back to your work now. <laughs> I feel personally honoured to be sharing the same stage as such esteemed guests. In particular, this young man to my left, Mr. Galloway, who needs no introduction, but I would like to welcome him onto the podium. But before I do, I have to take an obligatory selfie, standard. Shax is known as the selfie king in Blackburn. Please put your hands together for Mr. Galloway.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Brothers and sisters, comrades and friends, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And Eid Mubarak to all faithful Muslims. May God accept your fast. I apologize for my late arrival. We had a very busy day uh, attending to constituent issues in Rochdale uh, because, of course, I am now the Member of Parliament for Rochdale. And I'd like to thank all the people from Blackburn who came many times uh, during the by-election campaign. Our, uh, our chief doesn't really have a title, Imtiaz Ahmed, uh, who is there. Imtiaz uh, was the, is the owner of the famous Suzuki garage, uh, which became synonymous with the campaign. I don't know if it sold many Suzukis, Imtiaz. <laughs> Maybe quite the contrary, uh, but uh, we'll always remember that campaign uh, in conjunction with the wonderful space that you uh, gave us. Imtiaz is our Azim, uh, our chief. Uh, young James, he's now 23, uh, but he'll always be young James. He's 24, he tells me, uh, was our election campaign coordinator, uh, in which case you're actually better off listening to him than me. The politics you know, uh, the electioneering techniques and wizardry you may not know so well, uh, so feel free to buttonhole him. And our force of nature, our sister Shanaz Sadiq, who is our candidate in Oldham East, and who is the, a real force of nature. She's a force of nature, I can, I can scarcely control her. Uh, but that's a good thing, because uh, for any mistakes that she might make, she makes 10 great calls and 10 great interventions. Uh, so that's our uh, delegation here, if you like, Yasser uh, from Podzi uh, and other uh, colleagues that I see around the room, Jack, our dear friend and parliamentary candidate in Bolton, to be announced later today. Uh, Jack is, like many of you, a former Labour councillor. Uh, and uh, there may be others that uh, catch my eye in the course of my address that are uh, standing either now in the local elections for us or getting ready to stand in the parliamentary elections. But more of that later. Uh, the young man at the front, uh, African gentleman who uh, made an intervention from the front, uh, asked, what's the cause? What's the cause? There's no point in dealing only with the symptoms. We have to know, understand, and analyze carefully and properly the cause. So in a paragraph, brother, the cause is this, that Israel is a European white colonial settlement state practicing apartheid just like all the other white European colonial settler states, like the Belgian Congo, like the laughably entitled Dutch East Indies, like the South Africa ruled by uh, British and uh, Dutch uh, people, like so-called Rhodesia, like so-called uh, so many other colonial states that were founded by the European empires in other people's territory, on other people's land, to steal other people's things, and in some cases, yours included in Africa, even to steal the people themselves. And we maintain a principled, unwavering stand with the occupied against the occupier. We will never support the occupier. We will always support the occupied 
and it's not up to us to decide how they resist European occupation. This is a key point. I worked for the African National Congress under the leadership of Nelson Mandela, including underground in apartheid South Africa, from north to south, east to west. It was not my decision what form the South African people's resistance to apartheid should take. And so when I joined it, I joined it without preconditions. That meant that if the armed wing of the African National Congress, Amkonte and says with the spear of the nation, mounted an armed intervention against apartheid, I had to be a part of that. Whether I was a participant in it, or approved it in advance, or agreed with its nature, was immaterial. And so we, in the Workers' Party, unconditionally support the right of the Palestinian people to resist their occupation in whichever way they decide. That's what solidarity means, you see. It's not a pick and mix. You're not required to support Hamas. I don't, in fact, support Hamas in the sense that I wouldn't be voting for them. But I don't have a vote. It's the responsibility only of the Palestinian people to pick their own leaders, not mine and definitely not our government. Definitely not the governments that are aiding the occupier in every crime that that occupier commits, about which two more later. So we're here because we agree with the slogan, no ceasefire, no vote. That might be the only thing that some of you agree with me on. But it's a pretty big thing. It's a pretty important thing. And I'm willing, if you are, to park all the many, maybe many other things that we disagree on to come together for that simple slogan, no ceasefire, no vote. That doesn't mean that I believe, and I've been saying this since the beginning of the conflict, that a ceasefire, whilst necessary, is even remotely sufficient. A ceasefire merely means that for the moment the guns fall silent. But I've lived through many ceasefires, many more than I could count. But they are always followed ineluctably by the outbreak of occupation violence versus the occupied or occupation violence against the occupier. And the whole thing begins again. Five times I led convoys from London all the way to Gaza. Some of you I know were with me on some of those convoys. One person in here was with me on three of those convoys. Those convoys were necessary because this all started long before October the 7th. The idea that October the 7th marked some new development is for the birds. You I mean you really have to be stupid to think that. There are some stupid people, but there are also wicked people who want to persuade you of that falsehood so that you will unequivocally condemn the action that was taken on October the 7th. But what about October the 6th? What about the previous October the 7th? What about all the October 7ths since 1948? You all know these things and don't need me to lecture you on them. But it is clear that there will be no ceasefire. It is clear 
that the slaughter continues. I thought, more fool me you might say, uh, that the killing of seven foreign aid workers, three of them British, all three of them British military veterans, would represent the opportunity for a sea change in our government's attitude to this issue. And I believed, more for me, when Rishi Sunak briefed the press that Britain was going to tell Netanyahu that they were legally advised that Israel was committing war crimes, crimes against humanity, and that ipso facto Britain could no longer supply weapons to Israel. And for a day or two, both the British and American governments seemed to be rocking, seemed to be unstable in their positions. But they've recovered. They've recovered their confidence. They've got, as we say in Glasgow, they've got their bottle back. And they are doubling down on their support for the slaughter. And as the government does, so the so-called opposition automatically follows. It looked for a day or two like Labour was going to follow the government down the road of concluding that we could no longer sell weapons uh, to Israel because of crimes against humanity, bordering, if not over, the border of genocide itself. But they too have doubled down. And therefore, I say to you unequivocally, I know there are some Labour people in the room, but there's no getting away from this fact. If you vote Labour, you're voting for genocide. You're voting for the great crime that has been committed against the Palestinian people. And Mira, in a way, I hear people say, oh, but this councillor, He's quite a good person. Or this councillor got a car park for the mosque. Or this councillor, or this MP even, has, uh, is sympathetic. That's not the point. They're standing for Labour. If you vote for them, you're voting for Keir Starmer. He's their leader. No votes for Starmer. Genocide Starmer. Anybody who votes for Starmer votes for Labour is voting for genocide. This we have to insist upon. And so, and so you need to decide how important was that car park for the mosque? Was it more important than all those children that Israel slaughtered with Labour support? I've just had a message from our candidate for police and crime commissioner in Bedfordshire in closing a BBC report today, where Labour are demanding that our candidate withdraws his leaflet, which accuses Labour of complicity in genocide. What should I do? asked our candidate. I said, put it on a big, big banner and take it around Bedfordshire. Take it around Bedfordshire. And so, I could say it in Arabic, but let me say it in English. We say to these people, these councillors that might be good, these MPs that might not be that bad, judge yourselves before you are judged. Yes. Judge yourself before you are judged. You had a chance before nominations closed to leave this rotten genocide party, miscalled Labour. You've got another chance before polling day on the 2nd of May, but your last chance is before the general election 2024. If you go into the general election of 2024, either as a candidate for Keir Starmer's Labour Party, or an activist asking people 
to vote for putting Keir Starmer into 10 Downing Street, you are damned forever. You will never be forgiven by us, by our children, by history. Least of all, will you be forgiven by the Palestinian people. So we have an iron-clad position on this. Never labor, no labor, whoever they are, whatever office they are standing for. It goes without saying, therefore, and I said it in relation to the black man independence, anybody who's standing against labor and who can help labor lose, we are with them. Wallahi, we are with them. We are with them and pray for their success. But, and this is the but, we believe it's far better if we all come together as one hand. One hand that can be seen, felt, and cannot be confused. Now I know that's difficult for some people. Either because they don't like me, I probably don't like them. But that isn't the point. Or because they have political disagreements with us. Somebody lobbied me on the way in about trans rights. You may have a different point of view from me on trans rights or on trade unionism or on net zero targets. You may. And that may be such a big issue for you that you cannot join with us. But I ask you to think about what can be achieved by having our logo on your ballot paper. First of all, it means you can't be confused with anybody else. You know, independents are great. But how do you define the independents? An independent group is even better. But what if another independent group also decide to stand? What if your name is Muhammad Abdul and there's a Muhammad Abdul on the other list? What if there's confusion amongst the electorate with no logo, no symbol, and all kinds of people claiming to be independent? We're standing hundreds of candidates at the general election. They'll all have the same symbol. They'll all have the same colors. We'll have a party political broadcast on television. We'll be included in every opinion poll. So you'll be able to measure how it's going. We'll have to be on the leaders' debates. There are many advantages to being part of a political party that post Rochdale is growing at a phenomenal rate. As James will tell you, I spend an inordinate amount of time, as I'm about to do in the corridor after this speech, hearing people who want tickets to stand for our party in the parliamentary election. We, we, we could stand in every seat in Britain twice with the number of people who want to be candidates. And I have to try and wisely adjudicate on competing claims. But that's a powerful national force. It's not the same as an independent. I repeat what I said, I support the independents. Whoever stands against Labour as an independent, I'll support them. But if we have a candidate in that constituency, we cannot guarantee that we will not be up against an independent, maybe three independents, at the general election. We'll try to be wise, but we have a project. And our project is not just about Gaza. Gaza is what brings us here in such numbers, together here in Blackburn today. But we don't think either that Gaza is the only issue or that foreign policy is the only policy that matters. We believe that Britain has been betrayed by the uni party 
on all kinds of things. And this post-industrial malaise into which our country has sunk lost its moorings. Pray to any quackery that comes along as the latest fad out of California. Pray to the latest demands of whoever is the President of the United States. I supported Brexit because I wanted Britain to be an independent country. An independent country that didn't take orders from Washington or from Brussels. That's the kind of Britain I want to see. Now Craig Murray is standing here in Blackburn. He's been here before. The Honourable Craig Murray could have been living a very, very comfortable life. Could have been in the House of Lords. He was a British ambassador at a young age and of the highest caliber. Another ambassador, friend of ours, told me recently that he used to read Craig's circular. These ambassadors send each other on a circular basis some ruminations, notes on the situation in their country and how they see the world situation. And that ambassador told me that he used to marvel at Craig Murray's circulars, his grasp, his literacy, his erudition, wisdom, wit. I tell you, we're giving you a Cristiano Ronaldo here in Blackburn, standing for the Workers' Party. He stood here before, you know. Some of you may remember his green fire engine going through the streets. For some, that's the most memorable memory of the campaign, but mine is a different one. Sorry to put it. Some of you may even have been involved. I hope not. My main memory of when Craig stood last time here in Blackburn was the Muslims carrying Jack Straw on their shoulder out of the count after Jack Straw had beaten him. Jack Straw! Dripping in blood! Dripping in Iraqi blood! Muslims were carrying him out of the count. What kind of Muslims could they be? What kind of slave mentality is that? Just two years before, Jack Straw had killed what became a million Iraqis, every one of them almost a Muslim. So I'm saying to the people in Blackburn, this is your chance to redeem yourselves. This is your chance to spit on the name Jack Straw and elect the Honourable Craig Murray as your Member of Parliament at the next general election. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ladies and gentlemen, Craig Murray for Blackburn. I can even see his uh, forthcoming merchandise to be CM7. So it's quite appropriate, to be fair. CM7. Mr. Murray, CM7 is going to be your merchandise, I'm thinking, going forward. <laughs> Let's get it on, inshallah. Thank you very much for that very ins inspirational talk, Mr. Galloway, as always. Much love. To you for that. I would like to introduce our next guest, Mr. Shoka Adam, independent parliamentary candidate for Leicester. He is also the brother of Ismail Patel from Kanzavaksa. Let me all greet you all with the universal salutations of peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The dynamics of being given an impromptu speech is twofold. One is I'll be less structured than even normal, and secondly, at least it'll be very, very short. 
as I wasn't expecting to speak. But after George, I don't think many words need to be said. I am, some people, let's say, are pragmatists tinged with idealism. I am an idealist tinged with pragmatism. Okay? And on that basis, I'm going to explain my motivation and my inspiration to stand as an independent candidate for somebody who has never even been part of any political party. I am a healthcare profession, but my passion has always been to fight wrongs, injustices, bigotry, racism, and in particular Islamophobia, because that happens to be the faith that I have been born into. In the last 10 years, there have been a catalogue of activities, actions, disasters, mostly man-made. And we have seen that those that are on the lowest socio-economic levels, those that are minorities, and in particular those that are Muslims, have bared the brunt of all of those. So if we take Brexit that our George voted for, the consequences, and at the time of that Brexit, it was fair game. It was fair game to attack anybody that was different. We see the subsequent of that, the financial crisis that hit, it was the minorities and the Muslim community and anybody that was slightly different that bared the brunt of it. For moving on, we had COVID, during which time it was because of Asians and in particular Muslims, and particularly in my city, Leicester, the virus wouldn't go away whilst they were having parties in the House of Commons. Okay? We have had in our city a real rise in certain nationalism which is causing friction between communities and it was multiculturalism isn't working. Okay? And then my inspiration. My inspiration is what is happening that everybody has said today is through the people of Gaza. Four months ago, I had no ambition of having the letters MP next to my name. As I said, I've never even been a member of a political party. I went to speak, along with 20, 25 of community members, to the incumbent John Ashworth, a Labour shadow cabinet minister with a 22,000 majority. To my shame, I begged him. Some people asked him, some people shouted at him. I begged him for one thing, because God forgive me, by that stage, only, only, 5,000 innocent men, women, and children had been murdered. And all I asked of him was, I want you to ask for is an immediate ceasefire. An immediate ceasefire. Nothing more, nothing controversial. Just an immediate ceasefire. You are representing a community, like that has been said before, 71% of which wanted that. We gave him 72 hours to respond. He did not respond. We contacted him again. Two weeks later, he responded with an email, a letter which I will release closer to the time of the election, where he articulated that Gaza is not really that important to the Muslim community, and it's not really the only sole reason they will vote for me, and there are other votes I can have, and I really don't need the Muslim vote. But this is a vote for humanity. He does not understand this. And that is why community members decided to stand and select an individual to combat this narrative for so long where all these incidences happened, there has never been a voice that stood out for us because the status quo between the Labour Party and the Tory Party, the Tory Party actually completes the Labour Party and the Labour Party actually completes the Tory Party. There is no dissimilarity. But up till this point, they've never had an option to vote for anybody else. And that is why, in the past three months, as an independent, we have created an entire network of a policy team, a social media team, a finance team, a legal team, and a complete strategy team. And we have, in the past few weeks, garnered so much support that, God willing, when the election comes, there will be one of the biggest political overturns in history when we overturn this 22,000 majority. I will end in this very, very quickly. There are people here from Friends of Aluxa, and there's people here from other campaigning groups, and I do not wish to demean the work that they do, but I do not wish my children or my children's children to march in the streets in the cold weather when it's raining and cold for the protection of the blowing up of innocent children. That is not something that I want that to, for them to do. But that is exactly and precisely they will do that 
if we do not make the change that we want to see in the world. The best time to have planted a tree, the best time to have planted a tree was 25 years ago. The second best time is today. And that is why we're going to make the change. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Shokat Saab. MashaAllah. Uh, so we have now uh, Mr. Giles, correct? Yeah. Uh, Would like to say a few words. So James Giles, please. Uh, thank you all, and good afternoon. Uh, my name is Councillor James Giles. I'm an independent uh, leader of the opposition on Kingston Council, which is down in southwest London. I was at the uh, London No Ceasefire, No Vote conference, and it's a pleasure to be up here as well and seeing a number of familiar faces here in the audience. Uh, just very briefly on practicalities, if I may, I ran George's campaign in uh, Rochdale, and uh, God willing, come the general, we'll hold that seat with many more to come. But the left for many years, if you ask me, uh, its biggest weakness has been factionalism, division, people disagreeing on ultimately quite minor points. Uh, and, I law and I praise the efforts of uh, you know, people uh, who have tried to set up numerous uh, movements over time, but the shifts, uh, the plates are shifting uh, in British politics. And this really, to me, is a moment. Uh, and if we don't come together now, under an umbrella, uh, and seize the opportunity that we have, uh, well, it will be a wasted opportunity. These come by once in a generation, maybe even once in a lifetime. And so it's great to see so many here today. My plea to you only very briefly is this. If you are standing, if you're considering standing, come and speak to us before the day is up. We want to hear from you. We want to know who you are, uh, because united we succeed, uh, divided we fall. That's all I have to say. Celine, there's a lady with her hand up back there. Shanaz, my question is to Shanaz. Shanaz, it's okay if you don't remember me. You are highly competent. You are, I can vouch for her. It's okay if you don't remember me. She is highly competent. I know you're standing for Oldham East. I wish you all the best. She is competent. We're in Blackburn, so, you know. Anyway, other than the Gaza issue, other than the Gaza issue, what is your concern for Oldham? She's coming as a speaker next. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, James. So, on, on that note, I would like to invite uh, Shanaz Siddiqui, if that's okay. Shanaz is a prospective parliamentary candidate for Oldham and Saddleworth for the Workers' Party Britain, and to be honest, needs no introduction either. Described most recently in national media as a right-hand woman of George Galloway, and a force to be reckoned with, which has been confirmed also. Um, she now started her career as a college lecturer in 1990 with 18 years of service at Accrington College and went on to lead the business development team supporting hundreds of businesses to access literacy and numeracy in the workplace across East Lancashire. Shanaz was the CEO and director of a group of private sector colleagues and sorry colleges and went on to be a freelance journalist speaking out against uh, human rights atrocities speaking locally nationally and on international platforms including the European Union on Kashmir and Palestine along with their experience as a magistrate she has worked alongside many businesses and charities including uh, in Blackburn with Asian Business Federation and many more. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Shanaz Siddiqui. Auzubillahi minash shaitwan ar-rajim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. 
Asalaamu As Alaikum, good afternoon, and thank you. Thank you, Blackburn Independent Group, for bringing us all together in this building. And before I go on to answer that question, Blackburn is a place where I've canvassed. Blackburn is a place where I've gone through the streets. And Blackburn was a place that I stood up against Jack Straw when he spoke about Muslim women and the veil and the niqab and then apologized. I was then, for my many mistakes, George, a member of the Labour Party, but many of us were. And like you said, for the mistakes that we make, we hope that Allah gives us the strength and the direction to rectify those mistakes and move forward. And it's on that note of moving forward that I want to start. Gaza is important to us, and Gaza is important to me as a daughter of Kashmir. The right for self-determination is a right that is given to us, ordained to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that then is endorsed by those said perpetrators that deny us that same right. If we had stood united and we had recognized the fall of those people and the occupation of those people decades before as we do now, perhaps we would not be here today. 7th of October was written in history for people that were killed. But there's been a normalization. 30 people, 300 people, 30,000 people, and we'll grow. We no longer ask the question of how many, we now ask the question, by whom? By whom? By whom? Ask yourself the question, by whom? It's not just the Labour Party and the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats and the Green Party have now jumped on the bad wagon by abolishing their position on NATO. It's people like you, people like me, who are responsible. And why are we responsible? Because I too remember that day, George, when the Muslim community picked Jock Straw up on his shoulders and celebrated a victory. What they should have done, quite rightly, George, is redeemed themselves and thrown him off those shoulders, <laughs> held him accountable for the people that he killed. And this is not about Muslims. Let's not be mistaken. Fitna is created, and I do not apologize for calling Shunak the voice of a devil. I will continue to call him the voice of the devil because it's people like him that divide and rule and divide and rule and we sit here asking the question, who? You and I are responsible. And yes, we are reminded about the cause, but should we be reminded about the cause? Why should we be reminded of the cause? It's beyond that. It's beyond that because we, as simple human beings, as a norm, watch it on our TikTok. We watch it on our Twitter feeds. We watch it on the TV screens if we're allowed, depending upon what channel we're tuned into. It's a norm. I actually remember during COVID, I started to tweet about the people that were dying during COVID. And then I stopped. I said, Shnaz, what are you doing? You're telling people that people, so many people have died today in Blackburn, so many people have died in Burnley, so many people have died in Manchester. And to me, it became an acceptable norm. It cannot be an acceptable norm. Do not allow it to be an acceptable norm that people around us are dying and we're begging for people to speak up against them. I've spent over 30 years campaigning up and down the country, up and down the country, and looking across to our politicians and wondering why. 
I no longer wonder why, because I have no expectations of them. They are complicitly involved in genocide. Genocide is the killing of people. It's the removing of generations. And it's done on target and purposely, not by mistake. You don't mistakenly kill someone. You don't mistakenly remove a whole generation. And you don't use apps and data and all IQ or whatever you call it. You don't use those things to be able to kill people without actually thinking it through and planning. And when planning is done, it means it's malicious. When planning is done, it means that they've actually thought it through. It's not a mistake. And do not be mistaken that it's a mistake. We are not idiots. We could go on and on about what we want to do and how we can do this. And I only have one way of knowing that we are on the right path is when we all stand united. And yes, my brothers and sisters are here as independents. And yes, morally we're with you. And yes, we will support you. But I ask you the question, why? Why do we need to be independents? Why can't we be one force? Why can't we stand together? And why can't we move forward? And to me, the only reason is fitna. In Blackburn, we have Pakistani community, we have the Indian community, we have Gujarati community, we have those that people may not be of any particular faith or background, and mixed communities. But we're all one. We're all one Ummah. And those people that are dividing us and are creating that friction between us, tell them to stop. Just as we're saying no to, to people that are explicitly involved, we're also saying no to those people, those leaders that pretend that they're doing otherwise. So finally, my sister, when we stand as parliamentarians, we stand within a party structure as I do within the Workers' Party. And we have a manifesto that clearly outlines our position. And it clearly outlines our, outlines our position on the international politics, foreign affairs, but also on national agenda. And our agenda is very clear. Our agenda is about being the voice of those people that have been forgotten. It is about standing for industries, making sure that industry comes in, poverty, education, crime, all those things. But the one clear difference about us and the next person is this, is that we mean it. We mean it. And we will do whatever is in our power to ensure it happens. Local councillors, you are a formidable force. Local councillors, you are the backbone of the general election. If anybody says to you, how are you going to make a difference? Tell them very clearly, is we know our communities, we represent our communities, and we'll move forward with our communities. So anybody that's here as a councillor, standing in the next local elections, you are our strength. And we and I, especially in Older Meese with Saddleworth, will be working with all the local councillors to ensure that what we pledge to do will make it happen. Thank you. Thank you, Shanaz, for that. Mashallah, really, really appreciate it. I would like to introduce our next guest, who is Lotte Colette. Is that correct? Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Lotte Colette is the leader of the independent socialist group on Haringey Council in North London. She, she, along with other members of the independent socialist group, left Labour principally over Gaza, but all of the group acknowledged that Gaza was the end point of a long process of di disillusion with the disillusional Labour. And the group presses the council not just on war in Gaza, on the war in Gaza, but on many other issues, including the question of workers' rights in local government. Please welcome Lotte Collette. Thank you. To all 
our brothers and sisters here today in Blackburn, my heartfelt thanks and greetings from my comrades in the Independent Socialist Group on Haringey Council in North London. You have all made us feel extremely welcome today. Thank you. Genocide in Gaza is the most important domestic and international political issue of the moment. How we respond to this is crucial if we are to be on the right side of history. Israel's response to the events of the 7th of October have been disproportionate. Over 30,000 human lives lost. It is not a legitimate war aim, it's a genocidal aim. Cutting off water, food and fuel is not a legal or a legitimate tool of war, it is genocide. The Palestinians that survive will be pushed into the Sinai Desert beyond Rafa, pushed out of their own lands yet again. This is genocide, with an aim to grab land and develop beachside properties already advertised in the US. The IDF have hunted down and murdered aid workers and members of the free press. Even the Tories are starting to divide and question the support for Netanyahu's Israel. Starmer split the Labour Party in October last year when he pushed the Israeli self-defence argument onto us, stifling all debate. That is why many of us left Labour and now sit as independents. But when the fighting stops, what are we as independents to do? No meek return to Labour. They've shaken off their fleas and we are forging new communities in which to grow. In Haringey, initially we tried as a left bloc within Labour. Left groups opposed and defeated the mass privatisation of the council's residential and commercial property portfolio, known as the HDV. But within Labour, our left bloc fell victim to the strong-arm, right-wing Labour thugs run by David Evans on behalf of Starmer. A left bloc within Labour has limited horizons. More than anything, this demonstrates the need for this independent movement of councillors. Our sincerest good luck to all those standing for election on the 2nd of May and to the allied movement of independent EPCs contesting the general election. For Palestine, we have to keep up the campaign against the colonial settler regime in what will remain of Gaza, the West Bank and East Jerusalem. We must target local government pension funds for divestment from complicit corporations. We must call out the apartheid regime, the mistruths and the cruelty of the Israeli state. Nicaragua is taking Germany to the international courts of justice over its continued arms sales to Israel. We have the opportunity to amplify the voices of the marginalized and stand in unwavering solidarity with the people of Palestine by forging deeper connections with movements advocating for Palestinian rights around the world and embracing the lessons coming from Latin America and fostering a more just and equitable world for us all. We stand with Nicaragua, with Cuba and our comrades in Latin America. We stand with our comrades at the Berlin Congress for Palestine who were forcibly shut down by the police. Climate change is not only a global issue, it is local. Every decision made by a council must be measured against a green index. If it fails, we must hold officers to account to find alternative green solutions for all that we are responsible for. Tackling climate change for a healthy borough and a healthy world. We need a new green approach to public transport particularly where buses have passed from municipal control to private operators. Remote communities need connectivity, not the private sector creaming off their profit. We must promote massive expansion of sustainable council housing. Our cities and towns are full of substandard homes where private landlords hold sway over the people. We must fight for fair rents for decent homes.
Where our councils have responsibility for health care, we must block privatisation of the National Health Service. Wes Streeting, you're not welcome here. Our councils should be the vehicles of equality across our community, promoting human rights for all, regardless of race, faith, disability, sexuality or gender. All people should be heard. And there is no place for the Racist Prevent programme. All of our council services should be provided by council employees, ending privatisation and contracting out. We have had 40 years of attacks on our trade unions. We need to stand up for workers' rights. As councillors, we push, must push our councils to pledge never to issue a work notice when confronted with a strike by staff. We should never break a strike. Workers covered by the minimum service levels work notices include our teachers, our tram drivers and our firefighters. Make sure you've got one of these. Code on the back. I need everyone involved in this campaign. There are some, <clears throat> these are some of the principles. These are the values that an independent left of Labour councillors movement should hold and should cherish. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, uh, Lotte. Thank you. Really appreciate that. So just to reiterate, defend the right to strike and there is a barcode on the back for you all to sign up, please. So please make sure you get onto that. Thank you. Very val valuable information. Uh, without further ado, we have a lady who's been sat very patiently since the morning, mashallah, like most of us, uh, but she has been particularly patient. I'd love to, uh, and gives me great honour to introduce Salma Yaku. Thank you. Salma has been a tireless campaigner for equality, justice and peace, one of the leaders of the anti-war movement standing against racism and Islamophobia. When Tony Blair invaded Iraq with the support of the Tories, ignoring the millions who protested against the war, she co-founded and was a leader of the National Respect Party and was elected twice as a local councillor in Birmingham and came close to unseating the Labour MP. Salma trained as a psychotherapist and works for the NHS, where she has been a senior manager in the NHS for over a decade and is a member of Unite the Union. She briefly joined the Labour Party when Jeremy Corbyn was leader and was shortlisted for Labour's West Midlands mayor selection, but is supporting the movement for independent councillors and MPs in the current context. Ladies and gentlemen, Salma Yaku. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Peace, peace, peace be upon you and upon us all. My brother introduced me as having been patient just because I've been here since the morning. It wasn't patience. I wanted to hear. I wanted to listen. I wanted to be with you at this time. Because my brothers and sisters, this is a key time. There are certain points in history where days and months affect the next century. And I believe that we are at that time now. And what you are doing here is important, not just for Blackburn, but for the country. I salute all of those councillors who bravely resigned and I salute all of those who are standing as independents. Because it does take courage. Because not everybody's done that. 
I've come from Birmingham. We are the largest local authority in Europe and not one single Labour councillor resigned. It shames me. It saddens me. So I've come for inspiration as much as to speak to you. Because we know what those pulls are. We know what those whispers are. That just stay. It doesn't make that much difference. What are you going to do that's going to change things? These things are out of our hands. It's foreign policy. It's over there. It's bigger than us. Just carry on with our lives. But no. There comes a time when moral courage has to be drawn on. Where we have to inspire each other and remind each other. And it's not a war that is thousands of miles away. It's a war that's been conducted from here. Just a few miles from here are the factories which are making components for the very bombs and missiles which are causing the limbs and bodies of innocent guards and children to be torn apart. And it's not enough for us to say, oh, my heart breaks when I look at those TikTok videos. I just can't bear to look at it. Bearing witness, bearing witness is the least of it. But we are in a country which has a say. It's still a bit of a wannabe, we know that. The whole overt empire days are over and it's on the coattails of America. But still, but still, what the United Kingdom says and does carries a ripple across the world. And if we don't say not in our name, then it can continue to do what it's doing. So when Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer unite as one, pretending that they're opposing each other, but unite as one when it comes to defending the atrocities, and not just defending the atrocities, but being wholly complicit in the atrocities, by using your taxpayer money, my taxpayer money, to fund the very genocide that we are witnessing, that we cannot say it's got nothing to do with us. We cannot say it's somebody else's business. It is our business. And the one thing, the one thing that these cowardly, immoral politicians fear and care about is a vote for them to keep them in their positions. We know every other day of the year, apart from election day, our voice doesn't matter. It's the lobbyists' voice and the lobbyists' money that puts them there, that keeps them there, that keeps them doing the lines that we are sick of hearing. When we say, how can they possibly do that? I'll tell you why. Because we've been bought off. My friend Andrew is going to be speaking next. I'm sure he'll reel off the facts and figures of the arms industry and the lobbyists and who has paid what for their line to be sold and for the innocent lives to be torn apart as a collateral damage for their profits. But we have a say on election day. And that's why that responsibility is a heavy one and an important one. So I beg you, I ask you, please support each and every independent that is standing on a platform to be a voice for the people of Gaza and for a progressive, a progressive politics here. Because again, there is no separation. Have you not seen how our own democracy has been totally impacted by the conduct of our foreign policy? Our freedoms, hard-won freedoms, are being taken away one by one. What happened in Germany last night would have seemed almost unimaginable that a British doctor was arrested at an airport simply for wanting to go to a conference to bear witness of what he'd seen in Gaza. How 2,000 German police tried to shut down a peaceful pro-Palestinian indoor rally. And it's happening here in the UK, where today, today is a special day, not just because of what's happening here in Blackburn, but because we've got a massive march in London, again turned out to be a voice for the people of Palestine. And again, it'll be called a hate march by our so-called leaders. Because they just dare to speak the truth, to be humanitarian. And they are called a 
extremists. Because in this country now, to speak up, you are going to be called an extremist. We've seen the things that Michael Gove and his mates are drawing up. 20 years ago, when we started the Stop the War Coalition, we predicted then, we predicted then that in their drive for war abroad, they would attack the civil liberties here and have an increase in Islamophobia. And it's sad, but true that that has come to pass. But even I could not have predicted that 20 years later we'd have such a brazen situation where now they cannot even pretend at least there was a bit of a debate about the weapons of mass destruction. It was a weapon of mass distraction, of course, because many of us knew then it was a lie. But okay, some people bought into that lie. We didn't have social media. But today there is no excuse. We know, we know there's a live genocide. So if this time people vote for the parties which are promoting the genocide, then we really cannot look ourselves in the mirror again. And the revolution here in the north, and if you've had Rochdale, we've shown what can happen, that people do not have to be taken for granted because that's the way the system is set up. You don't vote for one, you vote for the other, you get the same. We've said no, change is coming and the people of the north are showing that way. And so do not be disheartened. Do not slow down. This is a time to stand up. They want us to feel that it's hopeless. But it's time to get up off our knees. It's time to stop feeling so hopeless. If the people of Palestine, after 75 years of physical, emotional brutality waged against them, are still, are still standing up for dignity and freedom, they're not coming with begging bowls, my brothers and sisters. They're just simply standing for freedom and they too are our inspiration that despite the lies against them, despite the dehumanizing, where even babies, where even babies are justified as being legitimate targets by the Israeli government and our own government cannot bear to even condemn it with words. And the very weak that we see the atrocities increase, they say we'll send them more weapons anyway. We are the last line with the vestiges of democracy that we have left to use that precious vote. So in the next 19 days, you have a chance to send a powerful message of sending a whole group of independent councillors and pave the way for some more independent MPs. And I want to see, I want to see people like Andrew Feinstein elected in London. I want to see Craig Murray elected in Blackburn. We want to see a change up and down this country. Because I'm a realist. I'd love to see we're going to see a whole new change in the whole of the government. It's not going to happen, guys. Keir Starmer is likely going to be the, M be the PM. But we cannot, we cannot allow that to happen without serious opposition, serious pressure, and a mass movement being built from now, which over the next few years, and this is why I'm being cautious and realistic and determined, that this has got to be a long-term battle, a battle for the future of the people of this country, for our NHS, I've been introduced as somebody who's worked for the NHS, I'm proud to. I get told week in, week out, there is no more money. Yet just the last few days we were told we can increase spending on arms. The magic money tree is there for their wars. The austerity that we were told had to be imposed. They found billions and billions of pounds to give to their mates when it came to go COVID for PPE, which was never even used. We are the sixth richest country in the world. We have the means, we have the resources for dignity and services for all. To have housing building programme which allows accommodation for people in this country to live with dignity. But it's choices so that a few people can get even richer. That's what it's down to, human choice. And we're here to say we're going to exercise our choice. And we are not going to put up with a shower that we have at the moment. We are going to make our choices. We are going to create our choices. And the time for change is now. Thank you.
Wow, thank you very much. Well worth the wait, mashallah. And absolutely right, we are all warriors in this battle. Don your battle gear, and inshallah, we will succeed. Uh, thank you, thank you very much for that. Really appreciate it. So, just in case you're wondering where Mr. Galloway has gone, he's still here. He's uh, just having a bit of a breather. He will be back for your Q and A's uh, very shortly. Uh, our next guest, again, it gives me great pride and pleasure to introduce Mr. Andrew Feinstein. I hope I pronounced that correctly. If not, sack me now. I'm worthy of it. A uh, former ANC MP who served under Nelson Mandela, author of The Shadow World Inside the Global Arms Trade, and is likely to stand against Keir Starmer in Holborn and St Pancras. Ms. Feinstein, thank you. Thank you very much, and first of all, thank you to the organizers for the invitation. It's an enormous honor to be here with all of you, to speak after Selma, after Craig, after George, and to see so many absolutely brilliant independent candidates at a time of great difficulty. It is these sorts of meetings it is the resolve of so many people to show the courage that Selma was talking about, to take on our corrupt, mendacious, mediocre politicians, both in the local and the forthcoming general election. That gives me hope. I must at the outset apologize for the fact that I haven't been here the whole day. I was supposed to last night be participating in the Solidarity Conference with Palestine in Berlin. I was supposed to be speaking on a panel with Dr. Ghassan Abusita. Dr. Ghassan is a British-Palestinian doctor. He is involved with health workers for Palestine. He has been in and out of Gaza over the last six months to attempt to help those who are suffering. He was invited to Berlin by the conference organizers to give a first-hand account of the genocide that Germany, the United States, Britain, and many other Western European countries are complicit in. He was arrested at the airport in Berlin and interrogated for three hours. He was then deported and sent back to Britain. Now let's just think for a moment. Germany is a country that has committed two genocides in its history. For those of you who don't know, the indigenous people of Namibia were the victims of a genocide by the German state. My own mother lost dozens of her family in Germany's second genocide, the Holocaust. These people were gassed in Auschwitz, where I've had the honor of lecturing on genocide prevention. This is a country that is now providing not just political and diplomatic cover for the State of Israel as it commits genocide in Gaza, but is providing a significant number of the weapons that are being used to commit that genocide just as is the case with the United Kingdom. Yesterday, at the conference in solidarity with the people of Gaza, first of all, 
the police arrested a German Jew standing outside the conference venue with a placard that identified himself as a Jew against genocide. They then would not allow people to go into the conference venue. Then they stopped Dr. Gassan for even turning up for the panel that he and I were supposed to speak on. But an hour and a half before that panel was due to take place, the German police stormed the venue, cut off the electricity and the power, and brought the conference to a halt. Now, I don't know about you, but from the little bits of history I've picked up in my life, that sort of behavior is what we know as fascism. Germany is prepared to destroy its own democracy, its own freedom of speech, its own right to protest, to defend the indefensible, to defend the genocide being perpetrated against the people of Gaza. Germany is the last country on the planet that should be displaying such fascist behavior. And as a Jew, as a Jew, as the son of a Holocaust survivor, as someone who served with Nelson Mandela and introduced the first ever motion on the Holocaust in the entire history of the South African parliament, I am disgusted and appalled by the behavior of the German government. But let me tell you something, and this is not going to come as a shock to you. The British government is not very far behind. The behavior towards the massive marches that have been taking place, not just in London, but across the country, week after week, as the vast majority of British people say, and have been saying for six months, we demand an immediate ceasefire. The attitude of our government and our so-called opposition, describing those marches as hate marches, claiming that they undermine democracy because they call to account our politicians who are benefiting from this genocide. This is corroding our democracy. This is obliterating our right to speak, our right to speak what we want, where we want, about whom we want. And it cannot continue. And the only way we are going to stop it is by hurting these people, as Selma said, where they hurt most, at the ballot box and in their pockets. And let me explain to you why I talk about the corruption of our politicians and our political processes. Why we have to talk about Gaza in the same breath that we talk about the tough local issues that face our constituents every single day because they are inextricably linked together. And it is really important that as candidates, we make these links every day across the country in as many localities as we can. The global trade in weapons, which I've been investigating for 23 years now, is the most corrupt of all trades. It accounts for 40% of all corruption in all global trade. That is a truly terrifying number. In my own country, South Africa, just four years into our democracy, BAE Systems and Tony Blair turned up to bribe our newly elected politicians in order for BAE Systems to win an arms contract that they were not even shortlisted for. 
they paid 115 million pounds of bribes to cabinet ministers, to senior officials, to the head of the defense force, to executives in our state arms corporation. And at the same time they were doing that in South Africa, they were paying over a billion pounds of bribes in seven other countries around the world, destroying those countries' democracies, making those countries poorer, but also undermining the rule of law in Britain itself and corrupting our politics here. Because these massive bribes that are paid on each and every arms deal around the world don't only go to the buying country. Some of those bribes come back to the senior executives at our defense companies, to our political parties. The defense companies have been the biggest donors to political parties in the Western world since the Second World War. And some of that money go to our politicians as well. Sometimes, even when they're in office. So on the Al Yamama deal with Saudi Arabia, Mark Thatcher, the son of the then Prime Minister, was paid 12 million pounds in bribes. Tony Blair, since he has left office, has made a conservative estimate over 110 million pounds personally from the decision to invade Iraq and from his association with British and American arms companies. But how do they do this? How do these bribes continue that oil the wheels of our political systems? By ever increasing defense budgets. In 2023, Britain spent 53 billion pounds on defense. That excludes what they are spending to renew our nuclear weapons. A renewal that will ultimately cost you and me, the taxpayer, 172 billion pounds. So we need to have these ridiculously high defense budgets so that the bribes can be paid, so that the political parties can be funded, so that our politicians can be rich. And that is why my constituency MP, Keir Starmer, knows that even if he only occupies Downing Street for the length of time that Liz Truss did, do any of you remember her? She was the one who was the resident there for all of 49 days. 49 days that cost you and me 74 billion because of her incompetence. Starmer knows that if he makes the right decisions, even if he was only there for 49 days, he would be a multi-multi-millionaire for the rest of his life. And this is what is profoundly wrong with our politics. And it is why in this country we have the best democracy that money can buy. And it is also why Keir Starmer has pledged to increase British defence spending from 2 to 2.5% 2 of GDP by tens of billions of pounds. And why he said he is 100% committed to renewing our nuclear weapons. These tens of billions of pounds are money that should be coming into our communities, that should be helping us who are struggling with the cost of living crisis, that should be improving the NHS, not denuding it of money, that should be improving our education system, that should be ensuring people are paid a living wage for the work that they do and receive benefits that enable them to live a decent life. But our country and the economics of our country and the politics of our country 
have been destroyed and atrophied by neoliberalism. And Keir Starmer is only the latest cheerleader for that neoliberalism. And let us not forget, while he's talking about being an unqualified supporter of modernizing our nuclear weapons, what was one of the first things he said after he was elected leader of the Labour Party, a supposedly democratic socialist party? He said, I am an unqualified Zionist. And because of the fact that he has received, amongst others, four and a half million pounds, the biggest individual donation in the history of the Labour Party, from a South African billionaire called Gary Lubner, whose only political interest is ensuring there is no criticism of Israel. Keir Starmer, who claims to have been a human rights lawyer, has yet to pass comment on the interim ruling of the International Court of Justice in the case brought by my country, South Africa, against the State of Israel. This is a human rights lawyer who has lost all humanity. We cannot, we cannot allow this man to simply walk into Downing Street with a huge majority to do the damage he wants to do to this country. So, as we hurtle towards the local elections, as we think about the general election that will be held sometime this year, let us remind ourselves that when we say no ceasefire, no vote, when we demand that British arms sales to Israel, which are in terms of British law, illegal, let alone international law, when we say this, and when we demand an end to brutal, illegal occupation, an end to apartheid, and I cannot believe that I'm having to stand here in 2024, still demanding an end to apartheid in this world, when we say all these things, and when we make these demands, we must do so in the memory of the tens of thousands who have been slaughtered in cold blood in Gaza using our weapons made by companies who are subsidized with our tax pounds. We must do so as part of our struggle to help those in Gaza trying every single day just to stay alive. We must join them in their struggle on the campaign trail. And we must join them in their struggle for liberation and freedom. And finally, let us also do so to honor the memory of my former boss, perhaps the greatest anti-racist the world has known. For when Nelson Mandela emerged from 27 years in an apartheid prison, his first words on his release weren't, I'm free, let's have a party. Instead, he said, our freedom is incomplete without the freedom of the Palestinian people. Thank you. Wow. Just wow. Thank you very much, Mr. Feinstein, for your lovely, inspirational and amazing words. Okay, ladies and gents, so we are going to open up uh, a Q&A session with uh, Mr. Galloway. Straight question for George. In, in the discussion, you said you couldn't guarantee 
not standing in the same constituency or ward if people weren't in the Workers' Party. Now, we share an awful lot with you and there's some disagreements. What I'm asking is where people are locally based, they're anti-imperialist, anti-racist, anti-austerity, pro-Palestine, and they've got that record, would you really stand in the same constituency? Because I think that would be wrong. Well, you missed something out. Can they win? You missed that out. Now, I chose my words very carefully. We cannot guarantee that we will not end up on the same ballot paper against each other. By definition, that means that there will be occasions. One of them is on the stage here, Andrew. If Andrew is standing in St Pancras, of course we'll support him and will not stand against him. Because I can guarantee you that he stands a real chance of beating Keir Starmer. So it's, 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 I, I, I got your question, I knew you were going to ask it, because I saw what you said on the WhatsApp before you asked it. Now, if we meet someone who's anti-imperialist, who's uh, a locally based and all the other epithets that you recounted, and we judge that our candidate has got a better chance of succeeding than that candidate, then of course we'll end up against each other. But what do we lose from that? Our purpose is to see the defeat of Labour. Any votes that person got and any votes our candidate got would almost certainly both be coming from Labour and therefore making it more likely that Labour would lose. So it's not the end of the world if we end up in the same contest. But I'll give you another one. He's not here, but Jeremy Corbyn. Of course we will not stand against Jeremy Corbyn because he also stands a great chance of defeating Labour in his constituency. So if you're concerned about uh, the Liverpool situation, let's talk. I think the best thing, and here I raise something I didn't mention earlier, you can stand with two identities. You could be Labour and Cooperative Party. You could be Liverpool Independence Group and Workers' Party. You can have two on the uh, candidate's description. And that's something we're ready to talk about. We have spoken to some people already about that. So there are different ways of achieving it. Uh, it's not bluster. Going back to the WhatsApp, it's not bluster. It's not bluster at all. It's a recognition of a practical reality that we are a national party with a member of parliament after May the 2nd with quite a considerable number of councillors, I believe, who are going to be standing in hundreds of constituencies and thus be a feature in the national election. Now that means, by definition, we have to find constituencies for these hundreds of candidates to run in. But if there are exceptional circumstances, as there are in Liverpool, uh, we are more than happy to reach an accommodation. All I said was we couldn't guarantee. We couldn't guarantee. That's an obvious point to make. If we judge that our chances are better than the other person's chances, then obviously we reserve the right to stand there. But still your beating heart. I'm Gorst's biggest fan. I'm his biggest fan. Yeah. Another question here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to start with something Andrew said about 49 day PM. That sounds like the rough length of a, a by election, um, and that sounds about right, perhaps. I agree with George that you can uh, very, very likely beat Keir Starmer, and I wouldn't like to be the la most loyal Labour MP with the biggest majority waiting for that tap on the shoulder for the PM to stand in my seat and live out of a suitcase for seven weeks in order to become a multi-millionaire later down the line. Um, 
I mean, I think that it's a, a mile wide, but an inch deep, the support for Starmer. Partygate, trust, little Rishi Sunak. He's had it very, very lucky from the Tories. But if we get 500 a non voter possibly rigged, going through the courts now, nodding dog rather than Churchill MPs, it could be the worst parliament ever. So my question to George is very specific. Were there any more than usual, and I should have checked this myself, and if you don't know it, maybe we can ask James later on, were there any more than usual spoilt votes in your election in Rochdale? Because remember, that's what Wes Streeting said the Labour line should be. So if they said stay away, you could say anyone who didn't turn up was sort of following their line. But now they've made it easy for us. And I don't think there'd have been a single ballot paper with Keir Starmer or Wes Streeting scrawled over it. But if you could confirm or deny that for us, that would be great. And I think we need to get the Tories out, but not Starmer in. And then Andrew, we've got a great, uh, we're in a great position to do that. At the, point, at the risk of one jarring note with, uh, with you, George, it might even help Labour in the rest of the country if the word gets out that Keir Starmer might not be the Prime Minister if Labour wins. Well, that's our goal. Uh, West Streeting's advice was taken by precisely 31 people. Thank you. Thank you for the question and thank you for the answer, George. All yours. My question is maybe may more to the organisers of this conference than to George. Uh, it's you know, what, what next for the independent candidates after today? And I'm not just talking about the general election, because as a number of speakers have said, you know, this, it's about creating a movement that can carry us forward. And thinking about the need for that movement and what that movement will, will, will look like. So, is there a WhatsApp that I can join? Will there be networks that can be created? Will there be future conferences like this? Are, are there any plans in place? Because I certainly don't want today to be an end. I want it to be more like a beginning. If, if I could just answer that one, I think the 3rd of May will pay, pave the way. 2nd of May will give us some results. And the 3rd of May, I think we will see that the alliances will, be, will, work, will move forward and become united in, in, a, in a better way. I, for one, believe they will join the Workers' Party. Can I just quickly add to that? One of my main reasons and my goals for standing as an independent is to create a template for future generations to come. I, my parents couldn't speak English. Uh, I grew up in this country in, in, in what would be considered possibly poverty today. And I want to create something that the future generations will know that we do not need to be subservient to other people that look slightly different to us and may appear to be more educated to us than us, but that they can do it. So you're quite right, this is not just a one-off. This is a template to create something magical for the future and the change. What that will look like, I'm not exactly sure, but we have to create that template for them today. At this point in time, there are a number of initiatives. It's not news that the left is generally quite fractured, but historically the left has eaten itself and people are really determined that this time given the live genocide that's happening, that people take a pause, and as puritanical as it's easy to become when you hold strong positions, to say, guys, let's keep our eye on the prize. And so, yes, we have the Workers' Party. We have Jeremy Corbyn's Peace and Justice um, project, which may at some point, not in the near, near future, I would say, but at some point may well develop into a political party. We've got initiatives like the Collective, which is not a party, but is supporting independent standing uh, in lots of places. We have anti-austerity movement. I think at this time, it's about people standing up. The election is an important catalyst, but it's about those various movements joining and supporting each other where the commonality organically arises. So for me, it's about being realistic, building step by step, and reinforcing, not pulling apart.
Also, just to add to that very quickly, um, amongst those groupings that Selma has mentioned, I would also add the For the Many Network, which is an in initiative of Ken Loach and a, and a group of people, trade unionists and various others, which is really intended as a network to ensure that there is communication. And I think this is our biggest challenge. You know, if we look, and George was talking earlier about the experience that he has had personally, and obviously I cut my political teeth in the liberation struggle in South Africa. And what was crucial to the success of that struggle was the fact that the ANC and the liberation movement was such a broad movement. You know, there were people in the ANC, I mean, that chopped me on occasions because of how right-wing some of their economics were. And then there were people who were on what some would in normal times describe as the far left. We're all now described as the far left, if we're sort of not actually of the far right, which is what the majority of our politicians seem to be. So I think the lesson of the successful South African liberation struggle for us who would describe ourselves as progressives in the UK at the moment is that we have to be unified. And I think what people have said here, and certainly since I've been here um, this afternoon, everybody is talking the message of unity. And there must come a time when we all come together and we create one united grassroots mass movement in this country. And The imperative for that is going to be profound very soon after this next election, because let's remind ourselves that this is the British ruling class playing. That's how they see the election. And we have an opportunity to upset their little play session. And, you know, whether the person at the dispatch box is wearing the blue tie or the red tie is going to make no difference to the lives of the vast majority of people in this country. And that's the point we need to be unified to build that movement that we've all voiced, both amongst yourselves and from the platform, that we all want. Yeah. I'd just like to add to that, that this feels like a transformational moment. This feels like we are at the start of something new and big in this country. And it feels like there's a new hope. It feels like there's a real fundamental change happened, and it's the catalyst for that has been what's happened in Gaza. And what's happened is many people, particularly the entire younger generation, but many, many people have come to realize the vast gulf that exists between the truth of what's actually happening in the world and what they see in their mobile telephones and what the media is telling them. And that, once you have that realization, you realize it's not only true about Gaza, it's true about so many things, that we live in a world where news and information was dominated so long by corporations acting on behalf of billionaires or the state pumping out propaganda. But people have now seen through it. And they've also seen this fantastic disconnect where the large majority of the population want the genocide to stop, but the political parties, the established political parties, all want the genocide to continue. And that has led the scales to fall from people's eyes about the lack of democracy in this country and the desire for a new people's movement to bring back real democracy and give back power to the people. And in building a new and broad movement, of course, um, we have to get it together. You know, this, this is the start of something. It's the start of something big. It has different components, but we're all here together today, all sharing solidarity, all sharing a demand for justice, all sharing together in our desire for social change. And I've no doubt whatsoever, the institutional arrangements will take a little time to develop, but they're just institutional arrangements. What matters is the movement and the people and those we have.
Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, I think um, my question has slightly been addressed, but I'd like to sort of uh, give it another go, if you like. Uh, um, obviously, uh, we are in a very important moment here in history. Gaza is the number one issue, and we can see how it affects us all, and everybody's answered that much better than I can today. But I just want to bring attention to Andrew's point, um, where he says that brilliant line, I'm going to use that if you don't mind again and again, we had the best democracy in the world that money can buy, and yet here we all are, getting very excited about council elections and a general election that happens every five years. And everyone's been saying that, but I'd like to speak more about how it will never happen unless we have the organised movement that happened in South Africa and how we can do that. And, and just to keep that, 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 that is the prize, really. And, and that, you know, fair place to everyone here is I don't have the authority or the expertise. I'm very humble here. So many experts, so many people do so many brave things. But please, can we emphasise not to get drunk on electioneering. Keep the, the eye on the prize that you are leading from the front but no matter what your expertise, skills, bravery, we are leading from the back. And that happens with the marches. And a few, who would have predicted during that Ukraine war, as evil as that was, NATO, NATO, the Green Party, still backing NATO whilst pretending to support a ceasefire. Who would have thought in those dark days only before that we would have had 800,000 people on the streets and stopped the war, friends of Al-Aqsa, Muslim uh, Association of Britain, Palestine Solidarity Campaign, 12th National Demo. We have to keep that up and also support you all as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. No, we, we of course know that uh, elections are not the only thing in politics. But we are in, uh, I said uh, last year that 1848 was the year of revolutions, but 2024 is the year of elections. Uh, the American presidential election, the British general election, uh, these uh, local elections that are upon us, and elections are an important uh, battleground. We have to be in a position to contest them. They are, for a start, the one time in many people's busy lives that they are open to political argument. In fact, they're looking for political argument and solutions. Uh, so to you know, uh, abrogate our responsibilities of fighting those elections is to empower our enemies, to give them a free right. Uh, now, I'm one of those. Uh, I may look foolish in a few weeks, but I'm one of those who believes the general election is going to be in June, which means that no sooner will the local elections have happened, but we'll all be in the field fighting a general election, the most important general election that any of us have ever fought because of this moment that Honourable Craig Murray just mentioned. This is a turning point historically and we have a chance to bust the uni-party game. Uh, and so by the end of the summer we'll know uh, if that happened, if it worked or if it didn't work. We're not going to give up politics thereafter, whatever the outcome. Uh, but uh, we can't avoid being focused on, not fixated about, but focused on the elections in 2024. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Galloway. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Just on that, just can I have a round of applause for Richard from the Stop the War Coalition? Sorry, from the Stop the War Coalition. He's the gentleman who gave hell to Angela Rayner, one of our fundraising. Is that you? <laughs> It was a uh, same sign solidarity campaign, Palestine action, Manchester, Palestine action, Blackburn for Palestine, the direct action people, and uh, Jamelia as well, who's an individual, comes our coaches. Very brave people. Thank you, buddy. It's working. Uh, just a quick question to the panel. Obviously, you, you're aware of youth demand, the actions they've recently taken by painting the Labour Party office red. Uh, Ministry of Defence building, uh, laying siege to K.S. Thomas home, your constituency, Andrew. That type of action is what I would promote as part of all this other political activism. What's your thoughts on that type of action, this serious civil disobedience which is required, which I'm sure Andrew and many of you are aware during the apartheid years, that's what we used to do. 
you know, lay siege outside Barclays, etc., etc. What that type of action? What's your thoughts on youth demand? Thank you. Sorry, just very quickly. Um, I do a huge amount of work with Palestine Action. Um, I spent months traveling the country with the two founders, Huda Mori, um, Richard, and, and Loki, who I'm sure many people here know of, when we were basically just getting people to support um, the siege of the Leicester factory. As I mentioned earlier, I've been investigating the global arms trade and its horrific impact on our politics and our daily lives for 23 years. I have never seen as effective a way of campaigning against the arms trade, which is completely out of control, as we're seeing in Gaza, as direct action. And of course, it was, it, it was an absolutely central part of the struggle against apartheid in South Africa. It's been a central part of the Palestinian struggle against occupation and apartheid. And I think that we have a responsibility to support groups like Palestine Action, and, you know, not all of us can engage in direct action. Not all of us can climb up buildings. Not all of us are in a position to go to jail for a certain amount of time. But we can all contribute by helping in the behind-the-scenes organization, by providing food, by providing soccer, and by providing support to those incredibly brave people who are on the front line. And I do think that as the establishment in this country becomes more and more distanced from the people of the country, which is obviously witnessed by the reality that over 70% of people in this country wanted an immediate ceasefire in Gaza six months ago, and none of our mainstream politicians are prepared to endorse that sort of position, I think that divide is going to grow wider and wider. And I think that's the point at which we are going to see far more direct action against the British state and against the ruling elite in this country, and I absolutely support that. Thank you. It's working? Okay. My question, just two questions, short ones for Sir George. Uh, that's an honorary title from our independence of Lapin. So we're going to class you as Sir George from our end. Okay. <laughs> Now, being an MP there, uh, one of the questions, George, will you push for people who have gone abroad to fight this illegal war, atrocities, genocide, whatever you want to call it, will you speak in Parliament that these people should be charged upon their return, or some of them who have returned? That's one of the questions. The other one is a human rights one in Pakistan. As you know, the army is behind all this. We, it's, it's a fact, and UK is helping them with aid and stuff. Will you call for them not to support and release of Imran Khan? That's the only two questions. Thank you, George. Thank you. Uh, well, I have many times called for the release of Imran Khan, uh, and I entirely agree with you that the principal problem in Pakistan is army rule. Uh, an army like the Egyptian army that is actually working for somebody else rather than for their own people, for their own country. Uh, but I try not to get involved in inner Pakistani party politics for obvious reasons uh, because I'm the leader of a British political party and I'm trying to unite the maximum number of people uh, behind the uh, demands that we have here in Britain. But I will never turn my back on Imran Khan. Uh, first time I spoke with him was in Hyde Park 20 years ago or more uh, in the great anti-Iraq war demonstrations. And I fully uh, agree with you that he has been entirely dishonorably and uh, entirely treacherously dealt with by the army rule. Uh, I got the, my first of two Pakistani awards, the halal e Azam, for my work for the restoration of democracy in Pakistan. And I'm never going to turn my back on, on democracy. 
as I have the mic, if you'll permit me, just a nuance on uh, the a point that has just been made by Andrew about direct action. Uh, I support direct action where it takes us forward. I oppose it if it takes us back. Uh, I give you an example uh, of uh, two examples. The spray painting in red of the Labour headquarters, I entirely support. It's entirely apt, and they deserved it. Super gluing yourself to uh, the roof of an underground train station in the east end of London, uh, stopping thousands, tens of thousands, of workers in the east end of London getting to their work, I don't support. Because that kind of direct action turns people against us. Uh, we had this debate. i never forget, uh, at the time, I was one of the leaders of the Stop the War Coalition, at the time of the Iraq War, somebody suggested that we block all the bridges over uh, the Thames uh, in the run-up to Christmas. Uh, and I remember uh, very well John Rees made the point, uh, making hundreds of thousands of Londoners hate us because they can't get into London uh, to do their Christmas shopping is a very foolish thing to do. So there are some forms of direct action that are negative. Uh, and some that are positive. Andrew mentioned the most spectacularly positive, the siege of the uh, arms, uh, Israeli arms companies, uh, or working with Israeli arms companies uh, here in England. And uh, the heroes that did that will be forever remembered. So uh, from our point of view, it's not a blanket support for all direct action. And we appeal to people who are taking direct action not to take action that is going to harm the lives of, uh, of working class people and their families. Thank you very much for that, George. Yeah, I've, I've, I've got a question to the panel. Uh, today, first of all, solidarity and greetings from Manchester People's Assembly to this meeting today. And, and I think we give our particular support to all those independent candidates who have declared themselves today fighting for a better world. But my, my question is just looking forward a bit. At this coming election, the hatred of the Tories is so great around this country that millions of people will be doing anything to vote for any candidate that will bring them down because they've had enough of their corruption and their lies and their greed. And that is likely to lead in this general election, with hopefully some honourable exceptions in this room, to a very large Labour majority, which I think will disappear in months if not weeks after that election, because they will let down and disappoint millions of people in this country by doing nothing whatsoever to improve anyone's lives, do nothing to make a difference in Gaza or anywhere else in the world. And the danger of that, and this is my question to the panel, is that many people will look for an alternative and that alternative will come out of the remnants of the Tory party, led by people like Suella Braverman, Priti Patel, Liz Truss, supported undoubtedly by people like Farage, who will be spouting racist and neo-fascist propaganda in simplistic ways to try and win over particularly the most deprived and poorest people in the white working class communities of Britain. And the danger there is that we are going to need unity on the left more than ever we've needed it before. So my question to the panel is, do you really all totally agree that in that situation we have all got to come together and we've got to find a way to build a mass party of ordinary people supported by trade unions, supported by all races and all classes, 
to make sure that we can keep the neo-fascists out of power in this country. Thank you. Salma, thank you. The short answer is absolutely yes. Um, when I spoke, um, I spoke cautiously, and I said that this is a long-term battle. We have this year, George alluded to, this is the election year, and absolutely agree. And that's why we have to have everybody out this year around the elections. There's an opportunity, and we have to take it up. We cannot make life easier for people like Keir Starmer. On the other hand, this is a longer-term battle, and you've outlined it very clearly. And we've already seen the beginning of that. We saw how they turned, not just called the marches in London hate marches, the MPs, with the Speaker's help, with Keir Starmer's help, have now tried to say that MPs are so scared of Muslims in this country that they don't dare to show solidarity with Israel. You cannot make that up. But that's the rubbish that we've heard, and we saw Islamophobia rise so exponentially. And that's what the last refuge of these scoundrels is, racism. And the particular form of racism they're taking in this country is Islamophobia. So it's totally predictable that reform and the far right le that's left of the Tory party, that's what they're going to promote. And I also fear, actually, that under the, 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 the current Labour leadership, the authoritarianism of Keir Starmer will not challenge that narrative because it also suit him and the current party, that Labour party, and the form that he's now got it to justify the stasis and the lack of change that they're going to bring. So absolutely, the responsibility of having a genuine, progressive, united movement is on us. And the beginnings of that are right here, I believe. Just to add to that very quickly, for those of us who've actually had Keir Starmer as a member of parliament since 2015, to see how he's behaved since he's come into the constituency, how he behaved when he was the director of the Crown Prosecution Service, what his instincts are, and how he has behaved as leader of the Labour Party. You know, and, and what Summer said is absolutely crucially important because by instinct, he is inherently undemocratic and authoritarian, and that's incredibly important. And I would add to that, that the Labour Party under Keir Starmer has a very significant race problem. And that race problem is not only manifest through the fact that Keir Starmer's leadership has seen more Jews expelled from the Labour Party, more Jews than in the entire history of the party before he turned up, supposedly to combat anti-Semitism. Now, you know, with the greatest of respect, that's a little like expelling Nelson Mandela from the ANC in order to combat racism. It does not make a lot of sense. But, but, the far deeper racism problem in the party is the treatment of particularly women of color and of Muslims across the board. And I think it is absolutely incumbent upon us because, of course, there are many people in this country who want to see the Tories out. There is no point replacing little Rishi Sunak with little Keir Starmer. Those names that you mentioned genuinely send a shudder down everybody's spine. I mean, the Tory party are vile and, and nobody wants to see them. But the Labour Party at this moment in time are no different. I think somebody once said, they're basically the two cheeks of the same bat side. I don't know who said that. But, exactly. but that is why we have to make sure by being independent, overturning large majorities, we drag them back to where we want them to be. So then they start listening to us rather than us going to them with our begging bills. Uh, after what we saw in Germany yesterday, I'm sorry I had to go out the room, so I don't know if anyone mentioned it. But after what we saw in Berlin, and after what we are seeing already in Britain, I think we can say that the neo-fascists are already amongst us. They are uh, already, in the name of the Democrats, clamping down on liberty and freedom in the United States. In Germany, they're doing it 
in the name of social democracy and greenery. The German government is the Labour Party plus the Green Party. And what they did yesterday crossed a very important Rubicon. Germans in uniform dragging off Jews out of a public building for seeking to express themselves freely. I made the point this morning, earlier this morning, because I felt it in my bones, that many of the liberties we think we have, first of all, didn't come out of thin air had to be won by struggle, by our forefathers and foremothers. And equally, they are not permanent. It is not guaranteed that they are permanent. It is not impossible that measures, actions will be taken uh, to clamp down on us and what we are doing and saying. It's already happening in social media uh, social media companies in Europe and in Britain are already being ordered by the state to clamp down and suppress and algorithmically distort uh, the utterances of people like Andrew, people like me, uh, and you can feel it, I know uh, from my numbers that it's happening. Uh, so it's a short step from that to saying, you can't book this hall for a Palestine rally. And if you do, we'll send the police in to drag you out. Nobody should imagine that Britain is immune from that. If it happened in Germany, it can happen here. It's not even impossible that the pretensions of liberalism and the pretensions of liberal democracy are set aside. They find a reason. By the time we leave this room, there might be a war going on. Certainly by Sunday night, there might be a war going on. I mean, a really big war involving big powers and all out fighting. And in those circumstances, they may very well say, well, we're at war. So you can't do the things that you were previously able to do. You can't say the things you were previously saying. So, we have to be on our guard. I, I, I say this in relation to the uh, gentleman at the back in the green shirt. It's not that fascism might come after Keir Starmer is elected. Fascism is present already. And it's actually dressed in the garb of, of pink and green not necessarily in the garb of, you know, Priti Patel and the uh, right-wing Tories that he mentioned. So uh, my point is, I suppose that they are all the same, that there's no difference between them. If Keir Starmer is elected as the Prime Minister, I look forward to being his opposition. And I think he will daily give us lots of things to oppose him about for as long as we're able. Oh, George, I'd like you to say that phrase that you used for Starmer and Rishi Sunak again, if you don't mind. The, the very famous one. Rishi Sunak and Sir Kid Starver are two cheeks of the same arse. <laughs>